Morning, glory, evening, grace, brother, and sisters. Good to have everybody back along with us here with our Temperance Awakening and our seventh alcohol lecture and looking at alcohol and violence, going over something that is very important and a subject that a lot of people are probably fairly familiar with <clears throat> is um, violence. That is, uh, that's associated with alcohol. And by uh, way of introduction here, getting right into things, it's quite interesting. For many people, when they think about drinking alcohol, though, they think of the opposite, a way to relax, a way to socialize with people, and, you know, to put away the pressures and the tensions of life. But, you know, really for, like, about as long as, you know, we've had recorded history, you know, going all the way back to, you know, like the Old Testament, like the book of Proverbs, where Solomon wrote, you know, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. You know, we know alcohol to be associated with arguments, fights, brawls, rapes, spousal and child abuse, and even suicide. Like in, uh, <clears throat> like in uh, 1993, the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, uh, wrote something about alcohol in, a, in an article entitled Special Report to the U.S. Congress on Alcohol and Health. They wrote, alcohol is associated with a substantial proportion of human violence and perpetrators are often under the influence of alcohol. Oh. <clears throat> so, you know, quite interesting there. How can, uh, you know, alcohol, something that people, you know, associate with relaxing and socializing uh, can, you know, be, uh, be something so also closely related to violence. Just looking there at the hostility and aggression associated with alcohol, violence, which is, you know, a very elementary term whenever one person physically harms or tries to harm another person, is the most severe form of the more general behavior called aggression. You know, aggression can certainly also be conveyed through words, like a hostile remarks, insults, threats, hurtful gossip. Like a person can hurt other people emotionally or harm them by spreading lies or betraying secrets to their friends, teachers, family, or co-workers. <clears throat> like an average person might not ever witness criminal violence associated with alcohol, but, you know, lots of people, though, do kind of, you know, probably more people... You know, an average person is a bit familiar with, like, a loud and obnoxious drunk, you know, perhaps. And, uh, you know, to a victim of, uh, like, of a, of a violent act, any form of, a, of, of aggression, excuse me, can be frightening to somebody that has been a victim before. And if it continues on a regular basis, it can make a person miserable. And alcohol has been shown to promote aggression in all forms. And uh, in fact, a study reported in, two, in the year 2000 in alcohol and alcoholism showed that aggression among men increased along with their increased blood alcohol levels. Until the level got so high that the drinker was unable to act at all. And so just looking at some stats here. This is actually about 12 to 17 year olds, so this is for preteens and teenagers. A survey that was done by the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse. Actually, I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah, this, is, uh, this is the National Household Survey on Drug Abuse by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. In a 2001, it showed that... Um, <clears throat> that... Uh, this year, a survey done that year reporting any illicit drug use or alcohol use in the past year by the numbers of types of violent behaviors. People that 52% uh, of the people that uh, used alcohol had uh, two or more, at least two or more, violent behaviors. 40.4% was associated with illicit drug use. Those that had... Um, <clears throat> 39% of people who used alcohol abuse had at least one violent behavior, then 26.5% of people that used illicit drugs had, a, had at least one reported violent act. And so is this fact or fiction talking about the different kinds of alcohol? People say cheap, hard liquor is more likely to lead to violence than fine wine. That is actually false. 
That is false. I remember the verse that I quoted in Proverbs. Of course, that was several, several years ago by Solomon. But he said, wine is a mocker. Because today in our society, many people will kind of associate wine with a group of friends in a neighborhood pub, you know, sampling cheese with, you know, soothing music or something in the background. But a glass of wine and a shot of liquor have exactly the same effect on anybody. You know, some, you know, cultures, they might associate one more so like wine with a more elegant, pleasant culture. But, you know, that's not always the case, though. You know, using any type of alcohol can certainly make a person violent. And like people who do have a history of violent behavior, they tend to be, will tend to be, uh, who tend to be aggressive without, even without alcohol, might be more vulnerable to violence-provoking effects of alcohol. Still, though, <clears throat> you know, the statistical connection between alcohol and different forms of violence is certainly strong enough to suggest that something about alcohol itself brings out the worst in many individuals. Now, what is that mechanism, you know, about alcohol and violence? And psychologists have, um, have come up with a couple of basic theories about it, but it's really just that only, only a theories, people, uh, science, you know, anyway, like the science hasn't exactly, um, been able to say these things for definite, but the most popular theory is the disinhibition model, what they call the disinhibition model. This theory says that alcohol chemically blurs or deadens the parts of the brain that inhibit or hold back one's first impulsive reactions. So in non-scientific words, you know, when you're drunk, you lose control, and I agree with that wholeheartedly as well. You know, that's what I would say, even though, like, according to, you know, at least according to the United States Department of Health, there's not enough evidence that can uh, put that down in concrete, but, you know, it's heavily suggestive, and I certainly agree with it. And, you know, when a person feels insulted or threatened or think that somebody's, uh, Treating them unfairly, their first impulse, you know, is to lash out in retaliation. But normally, you know, they can control that impulse, at least among mature people. The better judgment tells them that they may have been misunderstood or misinterpreted the other person, and it probably isn't worth fighting about. And lastly, in any case, if they do fight, they might get hurt or, you know, get in trouble with the law, you know, get a domestic charge, or, you know, if it's a kid in school, they get kicked out of school or something, get in trouble with their parents. And any time two people strongly disagree, this agreement has the potential to become nasty or even violent. Fighting is usually the, the easy way out. It's really harder and more challenging to find a delicate compromise to think of a less offensive way of making a point or to simply agree to disagree. But alcohol makes that much more difficult to achieve. You know, because a drinker's mental faculties is numbed, you know, just like the old stereotype there. You know, like you have two people in a bar who are, you know, been drinking. They get, you know, they get in a fight over something silly. You know, you often hear about that. How do they get in a fight over something extremely, you know, some little silly disagreement that don't matter at all? You know, because, you know, their mental faculties have been numbed. And, you know, that just shows that anybody, you know, has the potential to become aggressive under the influence of alcohol when faced with provocation or threats. Like, some researchers have uh, tried to figure out the precise mechanism that's behind disinhibition. Like, uh, like in 2001, psychologist James W. Collott wrote a book called A Biological Psychology. He said that uh, alcohol may reduce the activity of serotonin, a chemical messenger in the brain that's believed to act as an inhibitor. Then other key brain chemicals involved in behavior and mood, such as dopamine, seem to also be disrupted by alcohol. Then a second theory is called alcohol expectancy. And this theory claims that in some cultures, people believe that alcohol all by itself can turn a drinker violent. And of course, you know, there, there certainly are like lots of people in North America, you know, in Europe, you know, that would be that way, especially, you know, people raised the way I was, like people raised in you know, more, you know, conservative, you know, religious families, you know, that are raised, that alcohol is bad, and, you know, they've always known alcohol to be associated, you know, with the works of evil. 
And so when people with that notion drink, you know, they almost expect to get into fights, like in some laboratory studies. People became more aggressive after drinking a non-alcoholic beverage that they believed was alcohol, but yet it wasn't. Then similarly, some criminals say that they use alcohol to overcome their fears and inhibitions before committing a violent crime. You know, they too believe in that equation that alcohol means aggression. And those expectations, you know, will obviously seem to encourage violent behavior when drinking. <clears throat> and, um, that theory is interesting, but, you know, might not obviously tell the whole story. Sometimes an emotional problem makes people act in a hostile and aggressive manner, and the same problem leads them to abuse alcohol as an escape. And, you know, when that happens, you know, that's the result of an underlying emotional cause. And then, like, something else associated with that as well is, um, there certainly is another feedback effect between violence and alcohol. People who have been victimized by violence are more likely to abuse alcohol like according, you know, to, uh, to other statistics, statistics that we'll probably read in later lectures. Like under the influence, you know, they might in turn commit violence against other people, as that often happens, especially, you know, within families, you know, kind of like the stereotypical thing there when you have a child, you know, that had a dad who was an alcoholic and they were abused, and then they grew up into the same thing, you know, they abuse alcohol and abuse their own children. You know, those, you know, generation repeats you know, often do happen, a pattern that's learned, you know, from a previous generation. And so now looking at violent crimes particularly, in a 1997 report, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism reported that a huge percentage of murderers were drinking at the time of their crimes, as many as 86% of them in some areas. Now, like up to 37% of uh, those committing assaults also had been drinking. And most other categories of crime showed similar high correlations with alcohol, like such as sexual assault and rape. And then, of course, spousal abuse was the highest one there. More than 60% of violence between spouses or partners involved alcohol. Then robbery is even also a part of that. Like, you would think of a robber as a person that needs a clear head to plan and carry out a crime, yet, according to a 2000, 2001 article in Alcohol Research and Health, nearly one-third of the people jailed for robbery say that they'd been drinking at the time of the crime. And that article also reported that a 1998 survey of violent offenders found that 38% of those in state prisons, 41% of those in local jails, and 41% of those people on probation reported that they had been using alcohol when they committed an offense. And, like, somebody can hear this and say, well, that isn't me. I would never attack another person, no matter how much alcohol that I had. Yet, the issue is, the issue might still affect you more than you think, because a large percentage of victims of violent crimes were also drinking when the crimes were committed. So keep, you know, keep that in mind. That's something that's important to know, that many people that are victimized especially, like, uh, people who were, you know, raped and assaulted. You know, they had been drinking whenever they were the victim of a violent crime. Like, without intending to, many people can sometimes innocently provoke a violent attack. And the recipe for violence often is violent tendencies on the part of the aggressor, too much alcohol in a word or gesture by the victim, is misinterpreted as a provocation. See, that often, you know, also happens there, the stereotypical scene, you know, like at a bar, like you have somebody that's been drinking, and, you know, they're just being silly, you know, telling a joke to somebody else, you know, that's over there drinking, yet the person they're telling that joke to is more so the, you know, the violent aggressor of drinking, and that person who was, you know, telling some silly joke when they were drinking, you know, becomes the victim. So, like, people under the influence of alcohol are, you know, not going to be tactful, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time. They might do or say things with no malicious intent that they would never say or do when they're sober. And as they continue to dig themselves into a hole, they might be too drunk to notice the facial expressions and body language of others. You know, that should be flashing the warning, you know, change the subject, sit down, stop waving your arms in the air, etc. 
Well, none of this excuses a person who commits a violent act, but it suggests, though, that being even mildly intoxicated can sometimes be quite dangerous. You know, for a non-violent individual, that's why it's best to abstain from alcohol altogether. And, you know, lastly, you know, simply, you know, whenever you're drunk, you know, you can be an easy target for criminals, especially, you know, when a, you know, when a place you shouldn't even be to begin with, like a nightclub, you know, or a bar. You know, a drunk person can exercise poor judgment. You know, especially like when they're alone in an isolated area, like when you're alone at a bar, like a club or something, and danger approaches, you might not be able to talk your way out of it or, you know, walk away <laughs> at all. And now looking particularly at sexual assaults and rape. Every major study on the subject of rape and sexual assault shows a strong correlation between these crimes and alcohol. And very often, both the perpetrator and the victim had been drinking when the crime took place. You know, just apart from the general link between alcohol and violence, additional factors are involved in sexual crimes. Like, uh, oftentimes, you know, male perpetrators often believe that alcohol enhances their sexual ability. Like, studies have actually shown, though, that it does the opposite. Like, we actually mentioned that in a lecture or two ago. Like, it's generally harder for a man to perform sexually after drinking <clears throat> than, you know, with no alcohol. The perpetrator may also believe in some old-fashioned myths about women and alcohol, which sensible people have long ago discarded that, um, you know, he could believe that nice women don't drink in public, so any woman who does so is probably any woman, you know, drinking in public, like at a bar or a club or something, is available for sexual intercourse. He can assume that a woman who agrees to drink with him is giving him a license to take sexual advantage of her, or he might honestly, you know, misinterpret her words and behavior. You know, alcohol can certainly prevent people from reading the complicated clues and hidden messages that govern sexual behavior. Like rapists, you know, often excuse their behavior by blaming alcohol, and they may even drink in advance in order to give themselves an excuse. <coughs> they also might knowingly exploit the fact that women get intoxicated on smaller amounts of alcohol and deliberately get women to drink too much. You know, and female victims, you know, can also certainly allow alcohol to cloud their judgment. Like, um, like as we've already said a couple of times, most women become intoxicated sooner, you know, than men. You know, even drinking the same amount of men, it takes less alcohol to make a lady intoxicated. And their ability to communicate their desires, including the decision not to engage in sexual behavior, could be impaired. And when the attack begins, women may not have all the mental and physical resources they need to fend it off. Then, like, also looking here at child abuse. Like, some of the saddest cases, you know, of alcohol-related violence in involves child abuse. This can include incest, usually committed by fathers, or physical abuse, which mothers are as likely to commit as fathers are. The National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University issued some frightening figures in a 1999 report. Children whose parents abuse alcohol and other drugs are 2.7 times more likely to physically abuse their children. Most child welfare and court professionals told the researchers that alcohol and other drugs caused or contributed to more than half of all cases of physical abuse. <clears throat> Like, when a parent is drunk, any kind of normal childhood behavior can trigger a violent response. Like, older kids, you know, can learn to avoid their parents or withdraw emotion, you know, or, you know, just withdraw from them emotionally and stay away from them. However, younger children, you know, can simply be unable to keep themselves from crying, disobeying, or, you know, somehow annoying their parents. Alcohol is estimated to be involved in close to half of all reported cases of incest. And in addition, even parents who do not themselves abuse their children, you know, may, if they do abuse alcohol, be unable to prevent other adults, sometimes alcohol abusers themselves, from harming their children. Just like a very popular, one of the most popular books ever written, A Child Called It by Dave Pelzer, who has a, um, a story. You kind of want to say, I want to say a good story, because he lived... He, he's, you know, he, uh, he survived the abuse, and he's a motivational speaker today and a very successful man. But a very horrible story, though, that he tells about his history of child abuse. I mean, it's awful. 
you know, you can go back and read that. Actually, his brother as well, after Dave Pelzer was taken out of the home, the mom abused his brother Richard Pelzer, who wrote a book called A Brother's Journey, which is also very popular as well. But uh, the mom that they had, can't think of her name right off top, but Mrs. Pelzer, who abused them, guess what? She was an alcoholic. She drank alcohol all the time. And now looking at spousal abuse. Of all violent crime, of all of these violent crimes, spousal abuse is the one most associated with alcohol. Study of 2,000 American couples in 1993 showed that domestic violence rates are 15 times higher in households where husbands are often drunk than in households where husbands don't drink. Broader studies show that between 60 and 70 percent of spousal violence cases involve alcohol. Usually both partners have been drinking. Clearly these incidents involve many other issues apart from just alcohol, but sometimes when alcohol abuse itself is a major subject of contention between the partners, one partner, you know, taking a single drink can trigger a violent confrontation. And cultural approval of violence is, you know, also a factor, you know, whenever, uh, whenever this happens, whenever it, whenever it escalates to violence. <clears throat> Like in many cases of spousal violence, the female partner is involved in violent behavior as well as the male, and she may have had as you know just as much to drink. And, but like we've already said, uh, women though are much more likely than men to suffer moderate or severe physical violence and harm, even in cases where they initiate the violence. And then something else here: self mutilation. Self mutilation or deliberate self harm is a serious emotional disorder that affects many that affects many people especially teenagers this is a, this is one of those that's more often gr uh, females than males you know it can include hitting cutting or burning one's skin pulling one's hair and even taking poison the individual doesn't want to do any lasting harm but he or she can't control the impulse and nobody has figured out yet why people behave this way, especially young people, but some therapists believe that they're trying to cover up emotional pain with physical pain. And uh, kids who do mutilate themselves, or not just kids, really anybody, you know, they may also abuse alcohol or other drugs. Like in many cases, alcohol and, and in uh, most cases, that is, alcohol and drug use is going to worsen the problem by contributing to feelings of low self-esteem and hopelessness. And then now here, looking at suicide. About 25,000 to 30,000 Americans kill themselves every year, and many thousands more attempt suicide, but they're not successful at it. The National Center for Substance Abuse Prevention reported in 1995 that alcohol seems to be one of the contributing factors in many of these sad cases. The center reported studies showing that more than one-third of suicide victims had positive blood alcohol levels. The percentage of alcohol in a person's bloodstream at any one time, that's what the BAL blood alcohol level is, and almost one quarter of these people had blood alcohol levels of 0.1 or higher, 0.1 of higher, which is considered intoxication in every single U.S. state. Even worse, alcohol is particularly associated with unplanned impulsive suicides rather than with premeditated acts because alcohol can reduce inhibitions, as we've already said, it can impair judgment and make depression worse. Any one of those effects could, could push a suicidal person over the edge and have them try to commit suicide. In 2002, the National Household Study on Drug Abuse found that kids aged 12 to 17 are more than twice as likely to be at risk for suicide if they drink alcohol. So that figure rises to three times as likely for kids also who use illegal drugs. So, you know, anybody unhappy enough to consider ending their life should certainly not drink, but go to somebody for help. So, then just last year to sum things up, you know, whatever the cause and effect relationship may be, alcohol is associated with many different kinds of violence. And so, you know, we should keep those things in mind. And just certainly should, and just abstain from alcohol altogether. <clears throat> so, and whenever you deal, you know, with violence, you know, with any type of violent situation, you know, go and get help, talk to somebody for help, and certainly keep alcohol out of the picture. 
like if you know somebody that is a victim of of a uh, <clears throat> of violence especially violence associated with alcohol you know go to some type of authority like civil services and you know get help about it and so thank you so much there for being with us here as we've looked at our seventh alcohol lecture and uh next uh lecture we will be looking at the causes of alcoholism so certainly look forward to that lecture as well next time so come on back and be with us and we'll see you then until then until the day break and the shallows flee away i am dr cooper and i love you and i appreciate you